Hello, welcome to Dog Food with Catherine Abel, the show about dogs that feeds the mind and spirit. Today I'm going to read Transported. It is a gorgeous day outside and my dogs are running back and forth, in and out, barking. So you might hear that in the background and uh, I'm not going to try to stop it because I like hearing them having a good time and they are especially that cur the one that sounds like a child <laughs> screaming that's the black mouth cur the pit bull you won't hear her she doesn't bark she's not aggressive the big black dog yes she has a big deep bark you'll hear her <laughs> but the excessive barker is bar none the black mouth cur okay today's story is transported Naomi can't sleep. She hasn't been able to sleep for a week. Has it been a week? It seems as though it's yesterday, the day she did the worst thing of her life. Her husband of 38 years is almost as bad off as she is. Neither one can look the other in the eyes for more than two seconds. Breakfast used to be their favorite meal. They'd been especially looking forward to it in their new house. The small breakfast nook jutted out into the backyard and from any seat one had a full view of the small but charming backyard. It was one of the reasons this house had been chosen, the manageable size of both the house and the yard. They began skipping breakfast, each giving his or her own implausible excuse, or today not saying anything, just not joining one another at the table. Both have black circles under their eyes, and neither one will talk about it. Things became worse after the appraiser came to take photos of the exterior and the roof. When Naomi opens the door, she barely even sees the appraiser, much less hears a word that comes out of her mouth. She nods her head, and the appraiser quickly disappears around the front right corner of the home to take photos of all sides and the ten-day-old roof. What catches and traps 100% of her attention is the neatly groomed Morky, standing with back feet on the back of the passenger seat and front feet on the rear passenger door, perched on the door and leaning out of the window as far as he confidently can. She can't take her eyes away from him. The window is rolled down all the way, and she marvels that he makes no attempt to jump out. He is so perfectly made. She's amazed the appraiser can walk out of his sight and not worry that he might be stolen or jump out. She's on the verge of approaching the car when she notices a big black shadow sit up and stare straight at her with clear brown eyes that assess and consider. No wonder the woman has no worries. She bets that big black dog won't allow anyone within five feet of her car. But the big dog is of no interest to Naomi. It's the little, obviously cherished dog who captivates her attention completely. Behind her, she can feel all the cold air leaving her home through the open doorway, but she doesn't care. She could stand and stare at the perfect little dog for the rest of her life, her hungry, sad eyes eating up every adorable inch of him. When the appraiser comes back around to the front door of the home, waving at her in cordial farewell, Naomi stops her to ask, What kind of dog is that? A Morky? What else, what else could she ask? How can she keep her here longer so she can stare at her dog? Well, what's that? A, a Yorkie Maltese, or so I'm told. I don't know if that's what he is. When my neighbors moved, they left him. Who cares what he is? He's loved. That's all that matters. Yes, yes, murmurs Naomi, who not even a month ago didn't understand what it meant to love a dog. Though now, she is heartbreakingly, painfully, ashamedly aware of what it means. Do you have a dog? The appraiser asks politely. She can see the woman is enamored with Luca and not quite ready for her to drive off with him. The question is innocent and without challenge or judgment. The woman is a complete stranger whom Naomi thinks she'll never see again, and she needs to confess to someone her terrible deed. Why not now to this person, who obviously loves dogs and enjoys the responsibility of them? The tough part will be not crying during the telling. We had a dog, but when we moved, he started acting out, 
tearing things up and uh, and attacking us, digging out of the yard. It was as if he became insane. We we couldn't control him, so we we took him to the shelter. And I I can't stop thinking about him. He's like your little dog. Then, three days later, someone told me that it would take up to a month for him to become acclimated to his new home. That because we had taken him from one unfortunate circumstance and given him a home, that maybe he thought we were leaving him, even though we were right here with him. He was my first dog, my first family pet, and I didn't understand. I didn't know that if I simply long walked him every morning and evening, he'd eventually settle down. I, I didn't know. I, I just didn't know. Call the shelter. Maybe he's still there. Tell them you made a mistake and that you didn't know. They're compassionate people. They will not judge you. They'll understand. What the appraiser didn't tell the homeowner was that owner surrenders are the first ones killed. They have no stay time. Not with the number of dogs and cats being constantly dumped every single day, all day long. There's a big sign right at the gate that reads, We are full. But people keep coming. The We are full sign meant that in order to make room for the dog, cat, rabbit, horse, pig, chickens, turkey, or ferret being surrendered, a dog, cat, rabbit, horse, pig, chickens, turkey, or ferret would have to be killed to make room. But the woman looked like she was about to cry, so the appraiser did not tell her these facts. She almost told her she could get another dog, there were so many, or she could foster then she thinks that she doesn't know these people and that maybe this woman isn't a good choice for either of these noble endeavors. The appraiser is saddened and repulsed by Naomi. She's trying her best not to judge the woman, but as she drives away, her eyes fall on her big black beauty who keeps her home, her and Luca safe. She was free on Facebook in a litter of 12. Luca was abandoned. She sighs and kisses Gabby when she puts her head on her shoulder, and she runs her hand over Luca's soft fur when he walks across her lap. She wishes she could help the woman somehow other than the prayer she speaks aloud as she heads to her next roof inspection. Naomi watched as the woman got into her car. She watched the two dogs naturally move toward her. She craned her neck and saw that the woman kissed the big black dog and gently rubbed her head. The little dog was lost to her sight, but she knew in her heart of hearts that when he jumped down from his perch on the window, he'd crawled onto her lap. She's able to hold back her tears until the door is firmly closed, and no one can see her shame. When Fred walks into the foyer, she tells him urgently, Please, Fred, we must call the shelter. If he's there, she said we could get him back. We just have to tell the truth. Hurry. Please hurry. The only words Fred hears are, we can get him back. His long, lanky legs carry him as fast as they can to the phone. She watches her husband's Milo injured hands Google info, then call the shelter. He hands the phone to her Milo injured hands. She looks at him with a questioning glance and sees him wipe a hand across his eyes and turn toward the now dreaded breakfast nook so she won't see his upset state. Since Milo no longer lived here, they couldn't bear to sit at the breakfast nook and look out onto the empty yard they'd unsuccessfully dog-proofed over and over again. A long red and green squeaky tube toy is lying on the grass like a snake. They'd purchased it as a preventative escape measure to keep him from burrowing under the fence. But when Milo first saw it, he'd gone insane, as though they'd set him on fire. Why hadn't they thrown it away yet? Animal shelter, we are full. How can I help you? says the flat, professional voice of Lizzie Wynn. Yes, hello, my name is Naomi Fitzsimmons. I brought a little brown and black dog in a week ago. Please, ma'am, is my dog still there? I, we, we made a horrible, terrible mistake, and we just want him home. I'm so sorry for the trouble, and will be happy to pay for all expenses accrued for his care. A week ago, Fitzsimmons, little brown and black dog, hold, please. The line goes silent. No music, just silence. Naomi's heart is pounding so hard she can't even breathe. She has an instant fantasy that by putting her on hold, the shelter worker knows exactly where he is. 
that he's not in a black bag in the freezer waiting for the landfill truck, but in one of the overfilled kennels waiting on a good future, waiting on her to come get him. He went to a rescue in Connecticut. Uh, a, a what? A Con Connecticut. But I want him back. Oh, my goodness. We'll, we'll pay you whatever you need. We made a mistake. Please. Can we have Milo back? We made a mistake. A mistake? If Lizzie asks, what does Naomi tell her? What was the mistake? The moving? Was that the first mistake? She and Fred had lived in their home for almost 40 years. They lived with her parents until college, then in dormitories until college ended. Upon graduation, they shared a lovely but intimate wedding ceremony and dinner reception, followed by the glorious honeymoon of moving into their first home. What had started out as 800 square feet had grown into 3,500 square feet as their family of two grew into a family of six. Their successful electrical business allowed them to build on addition after addition. Their children are grown now and married with families of their own. Two of their sons moved away, one to Oregon and the other to Indiana. Their other son and only daughter stayed, took over the business, grew it, sold it, started other businesses, and asked them again and again to move closer. Their daughter became a lawyer who married a lawyer and moved near her brother, who was an affable and helpful man who wanted his family, if not next door or across the street, then at most a block away. But Naomi and Fred were not the biggest fans of change. Even though their neighborhood had seriously declined in the last decade and continued to decline every minute, when their daughter told them that if they insisted on continuing to live in their home, to at least get a dog who would warn of impending doom. Their daughter is a divorce lawyer and sees impending doom as the natural way of life. Fred and Naomi spoke often of moving, but they just couldn't take the first step. Almost four decades is a long time to live in one place. Too long, said all four of their children. Maybe. But we built a marriage, a family, and a beautiful home. Almost 40 years, and we've got plenty of good to show for it, Fred always replied. Yes, Daddy, but the house is too big. The neighborhood is too dangerous for us to bring our children over. We want you closer to us. We're not asking you to move across country, just across town. And if not, then get a dog. Get a dog? Fred and Naomi didn't even know what that meant. The only dogs they saw were the ones chained in front or backyards who looked lonely, bored, and sick all the time. They'd never had a pet, and they didn't come from people who had dogs. What did it mean to get a dog? How did one do it? And then what did one do once the dog was in the home? The choice was taken out of their hands when their next-door neighbor died, and her daughter knocked on their door with what looked like an overstuffed fur pillow. She'd held the fur pillow out to them and asked if they wanted a dog. They didn't even know their neighbor had a dog. The daughter, an only child, had flown in from Chicago for the week. The week was up tomorrow. As she handed the dog over as if he were, in fact, an inanimate overstuffed pillow, she said it looked like her mother hadn't had him groomed in a while, yet reported, with no referencing knowledge, that he was a good pet to her. Fred had, with a kind heart and complete ignorance, reached for the dog. Milo had responded by viciously biting him on the tender meat between his thumb and forefinger. The daughter had grimaced and smiled at the same time and forgot to pull her long sleeve down, which revealed a livid red swollen bite mark on her forearm. The daughter had said thank you in a sterling professional manner, reached past them, and firmly closed their own door for them. Milo was released onto the living room floor like a wild animal. Naomi and Fred, prepared for action, were confused when Milo simply stood exactly where he'd been placed. They looked at him. They stood watching him. Until finally, in unison, both said, Where's his head and where's his tail? No movement noticed or forthcoming, Naomi announced. I'll call the mobile groomers and tell them it's an emergency. <laughs> an emergency is inevitably four times the cost, dear. But we can tell the kids we got a dog. Call the groomers now. Five hours later, Milo was five pounds lighter. The loss of hair revealed him to be almost a skeleton. The groomer was on the verge of calling the police until she heard the Fitzsimmons story. The combined lack of knowledge of the dog and the questions they asked regarding pet care convinced groomer Charisse 
that the story they told of just acquiring the dog was the truth. Plus, when Naomi returned from the neighbor's home and told the groomer and Fred that Alzheimer's was the cause of her demise, this did much to explain the state of criminal neglect of the dog. Charisse told them she doubted this dog had ever been outdoors. Feces had been caked in the fur on the rear and legs. His toenails had never been trimmed. Now, angered at the neglect of a little dog, Naomi returned to her deceased neighbor's house with purpose. She was eventually able to pry from the lips of the proud daughter that she'd ship the puppy to her mother when she started becoming ill. She'd hoped the puppy would be good company for her. What Naomi clearly understood was that the daughter sent the dog instead of herself. Milo, from the get-go, was understandably quite the little weirdo. His face, now clear of copious overgrowth, revealed blank, dark brown eyes which stared at Naomi and Fred. His habit of not moving was slowly broken by frequent trips outside with patients standing around by both Naomi and Fred. He would flinch when they attempted to pet him. Never having had a pet, they didn't know if this was normal. The dogs in commercials and on television shows certainly didn't act like this. They didn't want to think of him as being abused, so they didn't. He eventually gained weight and seemed to enjoy Charisse's monthly grooming visits, though neither Fred nor Naomi knew what a pet enjoying life looked like. He never barked, not once. He would sleep on the cushioned bed they provided, but never sought out their company. He was simply their roommate whom they happened to be feeding and escorting outside on a regular basis. When they told Charisse of his behavior, she told them it wasn't normal. When they told her how Milo was shipped to the Alzheimer's plagued mother, Charisse said he probably came from a puppy mill. To this day, Fred wishes he'd never uttered the words, What's a puppy mill? Because Charisse had spared no damning information whatsoever. She even showed them photos which they'd been unable to ever unsee. How on earth are puppy mills legal? Charisse told them to be patient, that maybe he'd come around and start acting normal. She informed them what normal looked and felt like. They would hope and wait and see. As Charisse drove away, she was so sorry that Milo was this couple's introduction to companion animals. She thought that after him, there'd be no others, because he was one little blank weirdo. It was as though he was brain damaged. Poor little guy. There was so much inbreeding at those puppy mills that they inevitably produced the poorest pets, both behaviorally and health-wise. It was as though he were a hospice patient, there, alive, but yet not there at all. A routine was established. Milo slept. Milo woke up. Milo went outside. Milo came inside. Milo ate. Repeat. He did not wag his tail. It simply hung limply behind him, flaccid, useless. Fred and Naomi didn't know that a healthy dog's tail is active when he's active. Sometimes it even wags in happy dream times. They tried to pet him, but really they didn't know how. And the nipping at outstretched hands was a constant deterrent. Naomi and Fred resigned themselves to Milo's disinterest. Other than the unexpected, inexplicable attacks, he was an easy fellow to have around, but still, they felt that there was something more that could be done to bring him out of his shell. They'd ask Charisse next month. As surely as one makes plans, life has other plans in store. The next morning, Fred and Naomi awakened to blood-curdling hysterical screaming. At 64 years of age, Fred didn't leap out of the king-size bed, but as a man who adhered to a four-day-a-week workout program, he got out of that bed in a pretty impressive and quick fashion. Naomi, a three-day-a-week yoga gal, soon followed. When they passed Milo on the dog bed at the foot of their bed, he was stretched full out, eyes open and unmoving. The wild screaming was coming from the front of the house, on the left, not on the right, which was Milo's former home. A woman in black trainers, bright fuchsia tights, and a fluorescent orange t-shirt was standing on the blacktop screaming her head off while pointing jerkily to a dark mass in the front yard. They both instantly recognized Tawana Mathers from two blocks over. Once morbidly obese, surly, and with two diabetes-induced heart attacks to her credit, she was now trim, muscular, and jovial thanks to her regular early morning walks and a drastic change in her eating habits. Naomi almost didn't recognize her due to her weight loss and athletic shape, 
She looked amazing. Naomi, an optimist and fierce complimenter of the achievements of others, was about to tell her how impressed she was, how wonderful she looked, how marvelous she must feel, when Fred grabbed her arm and pulled her back. She looked over at him, and seeing the shocked and frightened expression in his eyes and on his face, stopped right where she stood. The police soon confirmed the worst. A man no one claims to know was brutally stabbed to death. Their children waste no time and will not take no for an answer. The two daughters-in-law who lived states away proved why their home organization businesses were so successful. They'd organized the entire crew, four adult men, one adult daughter, assorted teenagers with strong backs, assorted grade schoolers with dexterous hands, and a surprising desire to be part of such a huge undertaking. Boxes are put together with the sure, repetitive sounds of tapes being stretched and adhered, the crinkle of packing paper, the gentle clacking of dishes, glasses, pots, and pans, the soft murmur of clothes and linens being folded, the whir of powerful vacuums and the slip-slap of disinfecting mops, until at last, eight hours later, the entire house, every wall, every shelf, every cabinet was empty and spotlessly clean. They were shown lovely new housing options, but neither could make a definitive decision. The stress of the murder of Milo, the long-needed move, the actual bustling moving that happened so fast and with so much genuine joy, singing and laughter, had rendered them dumb with exhaustion. Graciously, but with gentle urgency, the choice was made for them. No one could touch Milo. The grandchildren quickly learned to stay away as soon as they attempted to get to know him, to pet him. Plus... They were a little creeped out by his doing nothing. Not one of the family members had a pet or a history of pets in their upbringings. Once in their own bedrooms with their spouses or standing in front of their bathroom sinks brushing their teeth, they nodded their heads sagely as one or the other commented, and that's why we don't have pets. That dog was depressing. Milo was anything but depressing in the new house which was a lovely rusty red brick affair with brand new architectural shingles on the roof, a two-car attached garage, a low-maintenance yet tastefully executed landscaping design, and just enough square footage to allow for a vigorous schedule of fun extracurricular activities. The new home was unpacked and fully dressed in record time. Clean sheets were washed again to confirm the new washer worked much better and quieter than the 25-year-old washer left behind and to comfort Fred and Naomi. Because what says love more than clean, fresh-smelling bedding? Milo was transported at the end. When Fred returned to the empty house, except for the fractious Milo in his bed, he checked on the dog first. There was Milo in the exact same position in which they'd left him, lying on his side on his bed with his eyes open. Fred believes he can entice him into a suitably sized plastic kennel with a chunk of just-fried chicken tender. He's about to attempt the kindling of Milo when the view from the sunroom picture window beckons him outside. He slides back the glass door and steps out onto the covered patio. He looks around the yard and feels the barrenness of it. But why does he feel this? The trees and the flower beds are still there. The equipment shed is still there. Why does it feel so empty to him? He hears a noise from behind and turns to watch Milo come outside. He watches him walk around the yard in that strange, indifferent manner he has. He has a stiff-legged gait. He walks as though he can't bend his legs, but Fred knows he can. He doesn't stop to investigate anything. He doesn't use the bathroom. He just walks around the perimeter of the yard and strolls straight-legged back inside, ignoring Fred altogether. Fred shakes his head and wonders what the draw is, or madness, to have a pet. None of the parties in their household had been rewarded for the relationship or the close proximity. When he turns to go back inside, it dawns on him why the yard looks so empty. All of Naomi's bird feeders are gone. For some reason, this makes Fred choke up a little. He doesn't know why. It's foolish to think one has an emotional attachment to an object. He doesn't believe in that. He does believe in an emotional attachment to all of the emotional memories of living and nurturing life in this house for the past 38 years. His children played, prayed, fought, grew, cheered, built, and dreamed in this home. 
this safe haven he and Naomi had created. He breathes in deeply and tells a blank staring Milo, we'll do the same in the new house. You just watch. Milo enters the plastic crate without incident. There's not a sound from him during the entire drive over to the new home. It's not until Fred opens the door that leads from the garage to the utility room that Milo shows the first indication of protest. He growls when Fred closes the door on one life so that another may begin. Naomi takes the crate from Fred and places it at the end of the sofa while Fred returns to the car to retrieve his bed. She opens the little wire door, but Milo does not exit, nor does he come out that night, or the next morning, or the next morning. Naomi and Fred quietly discuss their options and decide to carry the crate to their small but charming backyard. Milo, still, will not exit the crate. Freshly seared steak, baked chicken breast, and grilled salmon bites fail to produce movement. So Naomi and Fred gently tilt the back of the crate toward the blue sky so that he'll be forced to exit. He does, but not on four little straight legs. He has become a landed jellyfish and flops out uncontrollably and blob-like onto the soft green grass. Naomi and Fred exchange a look and wait for the weird little dog to move. When Naomi reaches down to caress him, he lunges at her with teeth bared and insanity in his eyes. She jerks her hand back before he can make contact, and before he can re-enter the crate, Fred lifts it high and away. They both wonder what that old lady with Alzheimer's did to him to make him like this. Though, it wasn't what the old Alzheimer's lady did to him. It's what she didn't do. She never petted him. She never called his name. She didn't feed him, though she did lie about it to home health, who knew good and well she was lying and fed him anyway. She didn't care what he did during the morning, noon, or night. She didn't care about him at all. She never cared about anyone but herself, and that's why her daughter moved away as far and as fast as she could. As her illness progressed and the confusion intensified, she thought he was something other than what he was, and in her terror kicked him or screamed at him whenever she saw him. A life of neglect and terror and malnutrition made Milo into the little weirdo. He really was not. The situation did not improve. His unwarranted attacks increased. He began digging like a madman along the edge of the back fence. Thankfully, Fred and Naomi always caught him before he could escape. They went to the rock yard and hauled back rocks. Milo couldn't move to line the area where the fence almost met the grass. But the addition of the rocks set him off. Whenever he went into the backyard, he would do his business smell a rock, and begin howling a chorus that was so pitiful, so woefully off-key, and so wearisomely protracted, they feared the police would be called on them for noise pollution. The little dog would howl and howl and howl until Fred got out the thick blue beach towel and, letting it drop like a wall, gently corralled him inside. The attacks worsened until Fred and Naomi could no longer stand it. Bloodied ankles and feet were heavily wrapped in thick gauze and thicker wool socks. They didn't know what to do, until one day, they did. Naomi was bending over to pick up an envelope that had fallen off the kitchen bar to the floor. Had she not been so miserably accustomed to his attacks, she knows she would have lost an eye. From out of nowhere, Milo came speeding like a bullet at Naomi, faster than she'd ever seen him move. Her practice reflexes kicked in, and she jerked up and back two seconds before he leapt toward her, teeth bared and insanity in his eyes. The momentum of his leap carried him into the utility room where he landed and scurried mightily to regain his footing, and Naomi, convinced beyond a doubt, to launch another attack on her. Fred, awareness super heightened, quietly closed the door, securing the snarling dog before any damage could be inflicted on anyone. Unbeknownst to them, what they proceeded to do that afternoon, after much agonized discussion, saved more than the weird little dog's life. Milo was one of the rare cases where surrendering a dog to a full-capacity, high-kill shelter actually saved his life. Lizzie Wynn says the words again. He went to a rescue in Connecticut. What, what does that mean, ma'am? Is that, is that good or bad? Naomi asks. It's good. They'll make sure he finds a loving home. A loving home? What? 
Is she saying theirs have been full of hate? Naomi wants to pop off at the mouth so badly. Her hands ache from Milo inflicted wounds. The stress of the murder, the moving, the constant bloodletting attacks make her want to pinch Lizzie Wynn's head right off of her neck. But reason and compassion have always ruled in this particular woman. So instead, she asks her, Where in Connecticut? Which rescue will he go to? Lizzie almost tells her when she recalls the pleas for his return. Lizzie doesn't know the Fitzsimmons, but she does know most owner surrenders. Maybe Naomi is a rare one, but Lizzie, who sees callously dumped dog after dumped dog all day long, cannot bring herself to believe she is. I'll look it up and call you back. Naomi thanks her and slowly puts down the phone. She knows the woman will never tell her. Where is he? asks Fred. Connecticut. What does that mean? She said uh, they'll make sure he finds a loving home. Naomi reads the impact of the insult on his face and knows exactly how he feels. She gazes at him in complete understanding and shrugs. I'm going to get some bird feed, Fred announces as he takes the keys off the counter and successfully fights down the urge to slam the door as he leaves. Naomi sighs deeply, sorrowfully. She feels like an utter failure. When her phone announces a new text, she doesn't even notice all the healing wounds on her hands as she reaches for the welcome distraction. Hi, this is the appraiser. I just wanted to check on you and see how it went with your dog. Are you okay? No, Naomi is not okay. Yes, we're fine. They said he went to a rescue in Connecticut. That's great. I was hoping for that. The shelter workers break their necks trying to get the animals to safety. I didn't want to tell you, but owner surrenders are the first ones to be put down. Naomi didn't know that, and it takes all of her willpower to hold back the vomit that is threatening to erupt from her stomach and mouth. I didn't know that. I know. So it's amazing that he got out so fast. They do incredible work there. Will you get another dog? No. We just want Milo. Look into fostering or transporting. You can still be around dogs and help them. What's transporting? A great Pyrenees mix is lying down in the back of Fred's Chevy Tahoe. Soft, commercial-free music plays on the radio, and Naomi hums along as they drive down the highway toward Dallas, Texas. Fred and Naomi are leg 10 of Maggie's journey to her new family in Red Willow, Nebraska. Naomi turns to glance back then to reach back to gently pet the dog's huge head. She's gorgeous. She's sweet. She's going to a home that has been fully vetted and deemed trustworthy of safeguarding a valuable and unique life. At the truck stop just outside Dallas, they pass the sturdy donated leash to the next drivers. No one asks anyone's name, and no small talk is made. The only interest any of the drivers have is for the dog. A dog who had a tail repeated too many times by too many dogs in the South. All Fred and Naomi know is that Maggie came from Florida. They're three years into transporting, and they're steadily increasing their encyclopedic knowledge about dogs. They say nothing, but both know that Florida is no place for a great Pyrenees. And luckily for her, at only a year and a half old, she'll have a tremendous future on a working sheep farm in southern Nebraska. While the transport coordinators are sparing in their details of the dog's past, they're generous with photos and information of the dog's futures. After all, who'd want to drive a gorgeous, healthy, intelligent, loving dog from one hell to another? Fred and Naomi revel in transporting at-risk animals across the United States and Canada. The more experienced they become at it, the longer distances they're eager to travel. They transport Mumu, a red healer from Texas to Colorado. They transport Lila, a German shepherd service dog whose charge passed away from Ville Platte, Louisiana to Brattleboro, Vermont. A Bernese mountain dog from Jackson, Mississippi to Saugerties, New York. An arthritic black and tan Doberman from Barrie, Georgia to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. North, always north. That is the constant mantra all southern transporters, shelters, and rescues repeat over and over again, get the dogs out of the South. Fred and Naomi talk long and rewardingly on these long rides, like the loving, long-married couple they are. 
As they discuss the plight of dogs in the South, they can't help but compare it to the era of slavery because what they, two people of color, are currently doing for the dogs was done for humans not too long ago. What is it about the South that seeks to enslave and destroy the living? What is it about the South, an area teeming with all forms of life everywhere, that can have such blatant and infectious contempt and disregard for it? It's reflected in the wages paid, the overflowing shelters, and the vast number of emaciated dogs hanging around trash dumpsters seeking to survive. College-educated and tremendous readers, it took them a long time before they could utter a term so disrespectful and hopeless. Dumpster dogs. Why does the South allow such a thoughtless generational pattern of treatment of so many valuable yet doomed lives? They call themselves the Overground Railway because they're saving the lives of the mistreated, enslaved, and abused, just like someone did for their ancestors not too very long ago. They're astounded by the number of people in these vast and highly coordinated endeavors. People from all walks of life, all cultures, all colors, are passionately involved in the simple act of no. No to euthanasia. No to abuse. No to neglect. No to contempt of life. They celebrate yes. Yes. We'll get you to a place of safety, caring, and consideration. Yes. You will have food, water, and climate-appropriate shelter. Those lonely, cold, hot, miserably filthy days are gone. Look how many people not only hope for a wonderful future for you, but are actively involved in making it happen, walking the talk every single day. There's so much more to your existence than what you've experienced. You may not believe us because you've only encountered brutal apathy from all the humans in your life, but where you're going... People get it. They get that you're a living, breathing, thinking, feeling, problem-solving being, just like they are. You'll be treasured and respected. We are blind in the South, and so, so, so very sorry. Naomi is getting up late on a Monday morning. She and Fred had a doozy of a transport over the weekend. Fifty-eight dogs and twelve cats traveled from Natchitoches, Louisiana to Delaware, Maryland, New York, Vermont, and finally, Maine, all in a 30-hour time span. It was absolutely exhausting, and one of the most spiritually uplifting experiences they'd ever had. Seventy beating hearts, seventy good minds, seventy souls moving from a locale of indifference to one of caring and a familial attitude. That was an aspect that took them the longest to believe and to wrap their minds around dogs and cats actually treated as family members. Neither Fred nor Naomi had a background of companion animal care, but both knew well the importance of a strong family, how growing up in a supportive and mentally healthy environment was critical to long-term growth and success in any area. Family is and has always been the backbone of their lives. Their sons and daughter, their families and their children were their treasures and their lifelines. But animals? Animals as family? Three years ago, they didn't know what this meant, what it could mean to treat a dog or cat as a family member. How is a family member treated? How is a family member regarded? How does one become a member of a family? Blood does not define the boundaries. Fred and Naomi have learned through sight, feeling, and thinking that love makes a family member. It's really as simple as that. To love another through illness, hardship, triumph, lack, and plenty. Through the minutes, hours, and days, supporting the one who's vulnerable and dependent on the emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical generosity of the one who has determined to build a family. Fred and Naomi have seen it for themselves too many times to count by now that it's completely possible and reasonable and right to treat an animal as a family member. Remember Carl and Grace in Idaho? The looks on their faces when Fred brought Kimba, a too skinny 12-week-old brown pit bull, out from the blanket-covered back seat? That couple standing there with Koozie, a long-haired and medium-sized breed with the black and white coat? Remember the alert intelligence in her eyes? The generosity of spirit of that dog because from nine weeks of age 
She'd been in a home that truly desired her, wanted, and appreciated everything about her. She was fed good food, got plenty of exercise and social interaction. They kept her long hair clean and free of matting and tangles. Her eyes were clear, observant, and gentle. Koozie had immediately accepted Kimba, and two pairs of practiced, kind hands welcomed him into a home in which he would live and thrive for the rest of his life. They know that animals can be treated as family members, not as human family, but as animal family. The respect and consideration can be active and present for both species. Naomi is headed to Brookshire's to get groceries for a crock-pot dish she read about that sounded both adventurous and delicious. They looked forward to the season of crisp, cold air and frost on the ground when a crock-pot dish made each bite taste like pure comfort. The four large green dumpsters behind the store are overflowing. Last week, the manager of the store told Naomi that while he hates to do it, he's putting up security cameras. The residents living behind the store have repeatedly complained of a community of raccoons that appears to be growing in size due to the bounty offered by the trash deposits of others who have no affiliation with the grocery store chain. The manager, Chad Shields, told her he understood that some people had no choice but to look for nearby dumpsters to deposit their waste. But the sloppy and inconsiderate manner in which they were constantly doing it trespassed not only on the actual property, but also on propriety and the civilized way of doing things. Chad didn't like having to put up security cameras, but the sloppy trash deposits slung hither and yon, the growing community of bolder and bolder raccoons, and the general unkempt appearance of the back area of the store that was visible to the endless stream of cars passing by forced his hand. The stench of rotting food, dirty diapers, and general trash smells was very off-putting for the customers and neighborhood. Naomi grimaces when she sees the huge overflowing dumpsters. She can see decaying piles of food, torn clothes, broken plastic toys, all manner of unsightly discarded things. It's not a pleasant view. This area is a nice, clean, and safe place to live and rear children. The public schools are excellent, and the majority of the surrounding homes have landscaped yards in whose homes dwelled educated, highly trained individuals who work full-time jobs, and then some. It's one of the reasons their children chose their home for them. She's wrinkling her nose at the imagined terrible smell when a gray and white creature on the hunt for food steps out from behind the dumpster closest to the street. Naomi almost slams on the brakes because her dog-trained eyes know exactly what the creature is. A small breed dog, maybe even a puppy. From her two-second glance, Naomi guesses the baby weighs around six pounds underneath that ungroomed, matted, filthy coat. She pulls into the parking lot, but far enough away so that she doesn't startle the dog and cause him or her to run away. She parks, turns off the motor, and reaches in the storage underneath the armrest for a leash. She can't help but smile ruefully as she does so. Who would have ever thought that she and Fred would always carry brightly colored slip leads wherever they go? It's amazing how much a life can change, how much a life can grow, how much a life can continue to grow. Age doesn't matter in the least. With the bright lime green leash in her right hand, Naomi sits still for a minute. She watches the little dog seek out anything that might ease the gnawing hunger in his or her belly. When she steps down from her SUV, she does so slowly and with confidence. This is not the first abandoned dog she has come upon at a dumpster and helped to a better life. And she or he will not be the last. When she's within ten feet of the dog, she pauses. The little dog has found a food bounty and is greedily scarfing up whatever was once deemed trash, but is presently sustaining life. Naomi stands as still as she can and waits for an empty belly to become full. The dog has white fluffy fur that is smeared gray and black with dirt. She can see mats in the fur and her heart breaks yet quickly mends as she knows that the days of grubbing around in people's trash to live are over. She hopes there are no serious health issues other than malnutrition. As she moves slowly closer, she notices crusty dark brown matter on both tips of the dog's ears. When she's almost within arm's reach, she squats down, 
The dog glances up and flinches, but resumes eating almost immediately. It must have been a long time since food filled the tiny belly. Naomi begins making soft noises with her mouth, gentle noises that beckon and comfort. The dog, a female Naomi can now see, doesn't stop eating. She scoots closer and closer until she's able to carefully get the lead around the dog's impossibly skinny neck. When the leash is secured, Naomi reaches over and picks her up. The moment her hand touches the soft, filthy coat, the dog turns her head, and her frightened, confused, desperately lonely and lost silver-gray eyes seek out Naomi's steady, warm brown gaze, and Naomi falls hopelessly in love. Just like that, a soul-deep connection is made. As she picks up the too skinny dog as gently as she would a newborn baby, the dog never takes her eyes from Naomi's. Naomi can read the confusion, can see the fatigue. She can also see the intelligence. The intelligence is there. But how does a dog who was born in a cage, taken from her mother, move to a home where all food needs were provided? How does this dog gain the knowledge to track, hunt, and kill if those skills have never been taught? We domesticate them to their doom, but not Fritzy. What did she just do? What did she just think? Oh, goodness, what has she done now? She caresses Fritzy, even though she can clearly see the thousands of fleas crawling all over her pink skin, even all over her face. Still, she hugs her close, secures her, and carries her to safety. Grocery trip indefinitely postponed, Naomi settles Fritzy in her lap as she drives a short distance back home, ignoring as best she can the black dots moving incessantly across the tiny dog's face and body. She's more aware of her skeleton that she can feel much too easily. Once inside, she takes the trembling dog to the farmhouse sink in the kitchen. While she readies the shampoo and clean white cotton towels, she gets the water to just the right temperature. Not too cool, not too warm. When Naomi places Fritzy under the running water, she doesn't fight her or even flinch. Naomi doesn't know if this is from overwhelming fatigue and physical weakness due to lack of food or because she's been to a groomer before, because this is a dog who requires regular grooming. Once her fur is wet, Naomi massages in the flea and tick shampoo one of the rescues had given her. It makes her want to weep when she sees that the water running off of her is brown from the blood of the tireless work of the fleas. She lathers and massages her until she can no longer see any fleas. Only ten ticks are found on her little belly. As she slowly and carefully washes her face, she looks down into eyes that are looking back at her, and her heart skips a beat, and she knows that this little dog is home. But doubt treacherously crawls into her thoughts. Remember what you did to poor Milo? First sign of trouble, and you dumped him. But I've learned so much since then. <laughs> so you say. You have never had a dog. Well, you did. His name was Milo. Where's Milo now, huh? Where's Milo now, huh? You ever even think about that poor dog you dumped at that high-kill shelter? I think about him all the time. Uh-huh. Stop it. I will if you will. I will and I am. I know how to love a dog now. And I will love this little dog until the day she dies. So you shut up. Stop. The unfair conversation comes to a halt and is never entered into again when Naomi sees and understands what has been done to Fritzy's ears. Fritzy's skin is pink like a Maltese, but she doesn't have the curling tail, and her fur has a scruffy texture mixed in with the softness. She's not a full Maltese, but one of her parents was. It looks like this unfortunate dog wound up in a home that was a backyard breeding operation for pit bulls. Someone performed a butchered homemade ear job on her. The squared-off tips of her ears are crusted with dried blood, which melts under the slow, patient attention of Naomi. As she cleans the butchered ears, Naomi is utterly dumbfounded, and then to her great dismay, she imagines the scene unfolding. People who don't yet understand what it means to be a human being are accustomed to forcefully holding down the pit bulls whom they berate and scold as necessary, or as the mood takes them, but little toy breed dogs? 
She shudders when she imagines in full color the scene of the miscreants holding this dog down on an old wide tree trunk and without any anesthesia, cutting off the tips of her ears for mysterious reasons known only to them. She knows most of the reason is because the people who did it do not understand animals. That animals, just like humans, are breathing, thinking, feeling beings. As hard as it is to accept, this is absolutely 100% true. So the one who cuts the pit bull's ears with scissors or butcher knife at the urging of his friend, cousin, son, or wife, or for the sheer sadistic curiosity of it, held Fritzy's little body down and sliced off the top two inches of each ear. The serenely shaped natural curve is gone. In its place are unnatural-looking blunt-cut ears which were never intended to be any shape other than the way they were created and molded in the first place. One of the ears is infected and swollen. What happened? Did she run away in terror after the insensate violence? Or was she thrown out of her home because they didn't like the way it turned out? Most likely the former. What is most shocking, though it shouldn't be, not here in Louisiana, is that the area where Fritzy was found, where Fred and Naomi live, is a very nice area. Obviously, some very terrible things are happening very near them. Once she has towel-dried her, she feeds her freshly sliced roast beef. While Fritzy is occupied with the meal, Naomi doctors her ears, then calls to make an appointment with the vet in a few hours' time. She picks her up, and as she kisses her little face, she holds her close to her heart. Soon, Fritzy falls into a deep, exhausted sleep on Naomi's lap in the recliner. Naomi watches her small chest move up and down. The regularity of the movement, comforting her, in a way she could never put into words. How would one explain the feeling of a soul being filled with light and love? When Fred comes home from a morning golf game, he finds his wife asleep in the recliner facing the picture window with a view to the backyard and the newly installed and planted evergreen wisteria trellis. He wonders at the white towel balled up in her lap, then stops in his tracks when the towel moves. A small, furry white face emerges from the cocoon. He's startled because Naomi has absolutely refused to foster dogs. She has been unable to forgive herself for taking Milo to the shelter. No amount of reasoning has moved her away from her self-damnation. She tells him the regular transports are their way of making a contribution and she won't be budged from her stance. But this? What is this? He won't allow himself to hope. He has wanted to share their home with a companion animal for over a year now, ever since he felt confident that they'd be responsible and knowledgeable pet parents. He watches the little dog watching him. What beautiful eyes! Are they silver or gray? Or a little of both? Such a quiet dog. Almost completely still. When he moves closer, the dog burrows back down into the generous folds of the towel on his wife's warm lap. He notices something awry with the dog's ears. He watches his wife slowly wake up when she feels the dog moving around. Fred's warm gaze is the first thing she sees. This man, the father of her children, her loving, kind, and compassionate husband of over four decades, does not say one word. He simply walks over, bends down, and kisses Naomi on her mouth. He doesn't pet the dog because he can see and sense it's not quite time for that. Not yet. Is it okay if we keep her? Naomi asks doubtfully, her never-retired feelings of shame over Milo coming to the fore. Of course we can. Do you know how long I've been waiting for this? Fred's grin is contagious, and Naomi returns his joy, but it falters somewhat when she says, I won't ever take her to the shelter. Fred lets out a long sigh. He thinks the time has finally come that she will actually allow him to mention Milo. He watches his wife's arm move back and forth, knowing that the hand attached to it is gently caressing their newest family member. Of course we won't. But Naomi, perhaps you'll allow me to tell you that your taking Milo to the shelter actually saved his life. Her arm stops moving, and Fred continues. I've been stalking Milo for two years. How on earth have you done that? Well, 
When we started doing the transports and learning about the rescue system that stretches across the entire world, I simply followed the clues until I found it. What clues? Fritzy, sensing a loving atmosphere, makes her way out of the towel cocoon to lean against Mama Naomi while she listens to Papa Fred tell the story of a Milo. Oh my goodness, she is so precious. What did you name her? Knowing that if his wife chose to keep her, the naming had been satisfactorily accomplished some time ago. Fritzy, says Naomi as she looks at the little dog with tenderness. Perfect. Just perfect. We'll all take such good care of each other, won't we, Fritzy? Before Naomi can help it, she begins crying. She's so happy to have Fritzy, but she's still so scared she's going to mess it up and not do right by her. Hold on, honey. Let me tell you about Milo. Fred says as he hands her two soft tissues before he continues the tale that will change everything once and for all. The lady at the shelter, Lizzie Wynn, had posted Milo immediately. Toy breed dogs get rescued fast, no matter the ailment or issues or neglect, no matter what. He was scooped up by Life Matters Rescue just outside of Danbury, Connecticut in New Fairfield. We weren't too far from him when we went to Westport two months ago. Stop crying. This is a story with a very happy ending. You remember how weird he acted? Think back over the last three years we've been transporting dogs and cats and lizards and rats and possums and hamsters all over North America and Canada. Do you ever recall seeing any dog act like Milo acted? Fred watches Naomi, knowing as he waits, she's mentally recalling every single dog they've ever met, on transport or not. Finally, she slowly shakes her head back and forth. That's because he had some rare disease, some bizarre mineral deficiency from the poor breeding or inbreeding or from the saturated neglect he endured before he even came to us. Well, this Connecticut rescue, life matters. That's right. Well, honey, they're loaded. They have so many wealthy animal-loving sponsors that no dog, all they do are dogs, who comes to them ever lacks for anything. So if it costs 10 or 20 or 50 grand to treat, so be it. They don't bat an eye. Milo went to doctors, then specialists, until he was accurately diagnosed and properly treated. Milo is okay? He's better than okay. The home he has, we never could have given him because we didn't know what we were doing. We do now. Yes, we do. Fritzy will have the life Milo, they kept his name, has, or whatever life she directs us to provide for her. We know now. Fred watches as Naomi fully and completely relaxes, her body molding to the recliner like jello in a mold. All stress evaporates. Fritzy responds by yipping once, then ducking her head, prepared for the customary strike or verbal reprimand. But Naomi only gathers her close and kisses her face. What happened to her ears? Louisiana, Naomi says quietly. Right. So, do you want to see him? Milo? How? He has social media accounts. I follow him. Naomi watches in calm amazement as Fred works the screen of his phone until he comes to that which he's been wanting to share with Naomi for years. Account and images located, he passes the phone to her, a huge smile on his face. When Naomi takes the phone from him, he reaches down to pick up their Fritzy, who goes to him with a wagging tail and trusting eyes. Fritzy, You'll be who you were supposed to be in no time at all. Let me show you the backyard while someone else gets set free. Naomi doesn't hear a word. How can she when the little brown-black dog she dumped at the shelter in ignorance is prancing across the screen with so much energy and personality that Naomi would have never believed for a second that this dog is the same dog who stood around their house staring blankly at nothing all the time. She watches video after video of him with his family, which looks to be a single mother with two small children. She watches him play, run, bark, grin into the camera, sleep in the mother's bed, ride in the car, sitting on any lap he can. She watches him run along beautiful tree-shaded trails and wade into the sparkling clear water of protected lakes. She watches him eat food from a spoon, enjoy a pup cake on two birthday parties just for him. 
She learns all about the expensive treatment he received and how, once properly diagnosed and sufficiently medicated and on an excellent fresh food diet, how he slowly changed into this fun-loving, active, super healthy dog. That tiny, frozen corner of her heart, that part which damned her a little bit every day, melts into pulsing life, and Naomi is set free. When she joins him outside, Fred can see the change immediately. No longer is her brow permanently crinkled. No longer are her movements hesitant and unnaturally unsure. Out on the back patio, Naomi reaches for the hand that's reaching for hers. She looks at him and knows that he understands she's thanking him for his endurance and forgiveness. While the too skinny dog meanders around the lovely and manageable yard, Fred and Naomi watch her, both of them thinking how wonderful it is when healing overtakes a home. Do uh, y'all think I made that story up about the white dog, about Fritzy getting her ears cut like that? Y'all think that's total fiction? It's not. That dog was on Nina's Road to Rescue. Little white dog, someone did that to her ears. Nina's Road to Rescue is a toy breed dog rescue. They're phenomenal. Dogs coming in constantly. Constantly. Toy breed dogs. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. And the shelters, it's true around here. I I live in um, northeast Louisiana, very close to Washita Parish. And Washita uh, Parish is a high kill shelter. I mean, and I mean high kill. And they fight like they, sp- and I, I, I'm not, when I say this, there's no exaggeration. Those individuals at that shelter spend every waking moment trying to get the dogs out to the north I mean we all send them to the north there you guys are different up there I don't know I don't know that y'all have problems I know that you have problems but of course you do not have the problems that we do down here I mean it's it's out of control and you know it's getting worse that's what's so bizarre it's actually getting worse down here we're just flagrantly ignoring everything it's it's I don't understand it I really don't because I know southern people and we're not a bunch of we're not a bunch of stupid rednecks we're smart giving we're wonderful I love southern people but about animals we have got this block and I have thought, I mean, obviously I've thought about it, and I can't stop thinking about it. I write about it, but I've thought about it. And here's the only, here's the only thing I can come up with as to the reason why we have such disdain for animals. And this is all animals. This is not just dogs. It's horses, cows, you name it. And here's what I think. I think with that we must we detach ourselves from them because because we eat them there's that and because we sell them they are a source of income for us and so I think that in order for us I mean it's the only thing I can come up with it's the only thing I can come up with one day it was a gorgeous day outside I mean it was absolutely beautiful and there were these cows a cow, you know how I, I don't know if you've ever seen a cow, but cows are, they're massive animals. I mean, they're truly massive animals. That thick fur, and they're beautiful too. They're beautiful in their own way. So one day I was going down a country road. We've got amazing country roads here. This area is beautiful. This area is, who can say the South is not a gorgeous place? You can't. This place is exquisite, breathtaking, and all the plants, the flora and fauna. Oh, it's, it's amazing. The only thing is the heat. I mean, the heat, that's the only drawback. 
And so I'm driving down the country, and there, there's a herd of cows out there. And uh, and um, I stopped. There was one right close to the, I mean, I was three feet away from the cow. And so I stopped my car, and I just sat there and looked at the cow. And that cow looked right back at me, considering me, thinking about me, wondering what I'm doing. That cow, that cow was thinking. I saw a video one time of a cow. This cow had been, I don't know, raised in, um, uh, raised in, in an environment where the purpose was not to eventually eat the animal. And the cow, this was a huge cow, okay? The cow was treated, the cow was treated as a, well, a family member, not, but was treated with con the consideration that one would give a family member. The cow was not treated as a rock, like we treat them down here. We treat animals, we think animals are rocks. They don't have feelings. They don't feel, they don't feel the cold. They don't feel the scorching heat. We, we don't, we literally do not believe that they feel. I'm telling you. Because if we, for two seconds, actually believed that animals feel, we would not do to them what we do to them. And so, in this video, the it was a young guy. He comes out and he's like petting the cow. And then all of a sudden, the cow turns to him and hugs him. I mean, wraps... I can't remember if the cow was a female or a male. Probably a, a cow, right? It must, be, it must have been male. It wasn't bull. So the cow, she she hugs this human. I mean, it was very obvious it was a hug and that this cow felt deep affection for this human being. Okay? And now all the... Um, all the vegetarians are going, yeah, that's why we don't eat cows. Well, I am a meat eater. I tried to be a vegan, vegetarian for six months, but I got headaches and weak need. So I went back to eating meat because I was seduced into it by a pair of fried pork chops that were fried to perfection. And there was no way I could say no, so I didn't. And I ate those fried pork chops. And I loved every single bite. And guess what else? My headaches disappeared and my energy returned fourfold. So some people can do vegetarianism and vegan. I'm not one of those people. I'm just not. And I, Don't beat me up. It's just the way it is. But I will say this, too. Yeah, I know the vegetarian people are not going to like it. But it's... It's the way it is. It's complete fact. It's been proven scientifically that animals who are, if you are hoping to harvest the animal for nourishment, animals who are treated humanely, who are loved in the field, given proper food, attention, treated with dignity. What's, you know, treat, come on, guess what? Their meat taste it, it is remarkably more delicious than say the regular cow who's out there you know just there's a herd they got numbers clamped to their ears that that's their identification i think that's very interesting and i believe it i believe it animals we're figuring it out it's not all gloom and doom there's a lot of it but we're figuring out and we're making leaps and bounds. For example, this transporting. I used to do the transporting with Walking in the Sun Rescue, which is a tr small, tiny, tiny little rescue here in Morehouse Parish. All volunteer-based. And she she works with, I mean, there are, she cannot turn on her phone. That's, that's what you hear. Yeah, let me tell you this. You want to start a rescue here in northeast Louisiana or anywhere in the south, uh, you might want to get two phones because the rescue phone never stops ringing. The text never stop coming. 
of people wanting you to help them get rid of their dog or cat or horse. If you want to get a picture of the way it truly is down here, and that probably is, I mean, because they've got rescues. You see that in Thailand. I mean, it's it's all over. But boy, it's, it's something else down here. But if you want to see a rescue that gives it gives a very very clear picture of the rescue effort and i mean they're doing their best they're always trying to come up with innovative ideas to find dogs homes they do they do all kind of stuff over there too though this this is the rescue you need to look at and you can all you need to do is follow them for a month if you can take it uh it's Dallas Dog RRR. Dallas Dog RRR. Dallas Dog Rescue, Rehabilitate, Rehome. And it's in Dallas. And they, it's in Dallas. But listen, these rescues, these rescues who are dedicated to, to rescuing, and man, they're, they're, you know, they're run by these people who have these huge hearts. Huge hearts. And um, this and some of these rescues, I mean, look, you get into there, and it is, you can't take it, because the amount of abuse and neglect you see, well, it's staggering, obviously. And it never, it never stops. I mean, it never stops. And some people, I've seen this, and I'm going to say women, because every rescue I know is run by women. These women, in this particular rescue, they have a personality or some kind of gear in their makeup that enables them to stay clear-headed and rational about the process, about what they're trying to do, and they don't lose sight, and they don't become emotional, and they do not, in this particular rescue, they do not become filled with hatred. This, you need to look at them. It's amazing. It is amazing. They've been around for years, too. I don't know how they do it. I, I can't, there's no way. I mean, I can't do it. I, I, I did it, and I, I'm i not built that way. I cannot look at all of, um, I can't look at all that suffering. It, it gets to me in a, in, a, um, in a negative way. So I had to step way back. But I remember on the transports. If you ever get to do a transport, you should do it. And, of course, you, you know, all you got to do is reach out in three minutes. They'll be, you know, you're like, yes, come on, help us. They always, rescues always need help. And so that's what you do. You get, they get the, the course of the dogs are coming in the shelter left and right. So they're, they are getting the dogs who are most viable candidates for our northern, and they go to the northern rescues, northern shelters. And, um... So they find dogs that they, they think are going to get homes. So guess what that means? Uh, you ain't seen a lot of pit bulls because people, you know, they got the pit bull bands and, and because we have pit bulls everywhere. But there is a rescue up north that's called Ulster County Canines, and they take our pit bulls. They are a great rescue I don't know how they do it I mean I don't know how they do it and so if you want to there there's that rescue go look at it Dallas dog RRR just just follow them for a month I mean the things they're doing they're amazing they're amazing I don't know how they do it I don't know how they do it and if you want to see horses because there's a rescue for everything there's a rescue for horses pigs, ferrets, lizards, snakes, uh, you name it, there is a rescue. And this one is for horses. And they, I mean, they they are doing everything in their power. And, and it's really, it's cool about her because the, the lady that who runs it, I mean, sometimes she just, God, I'm starting to cry when I think about it. I mean, she knocks herself out, and sometimes in her posts, she lets people know what she's feeling about 
what did she have seen? Oh, I can't even look at him. I can't look at that stuff anymore. Oh, gosh. It brings me to despair, the, that stuff. And then you know what follows despair? Lickety-split? Hatred. Despair and hatred are a dynamic duo, and they always travel together. You're not going to have one without the other. You just don't, because they go together, and they're going to find the other one. But they don't. Another, and this Rocking R Rescue is the name of it, and they're in Mississippi. And even though, I mean, they're saving horses. If you like horses, you need to go see some good work being done. And, of course, it's also non-stop. Non-stop. I don't even know how. You know what they say about dogs and cats that um, do it's a, it's spay and neuter, spay and neuter, spay and neuter to to um, to help with well to you know eliminate. I mean, isn't that the goal? Eliminate shelters. I mean, that's what we call them, but they're not shelters. They're prisons. They're animal prisons. Okay, they're animal prisons. I mean, that's what they are. Horses. I mean, what do you? How do you? How do you? Um, there was this horse rescue over here in uh, in Morehouse Parish. I think they had, what would they have? How many acres? I don't know how many acres they had, but they had a great setup. They had the, um, they had the big old barn, and then they, st- they just got into it lightly, and then guess what happened? People are dumping horses on them. I mean, so I, I, I went by there, I don't know when that was, a couple of years ago. Those people are gone. Of course they are course they are good for y'all get on out of there i mean you can't take it i don't know how those people take it those individuals at dallas dog rrr and the individuals at um at rock and r i don't i don't know how they deal with the uh i don't know how they deal with the sorrow for me the sorrow it it, it overwhelmed me i mean it just overwhelmed me truly but I know people, and there's another one, the rescue life. She's a tiny little rescue here. I'm walking in the sun, another one. They, these women, they're level-headed. They just have that gear where they can save the mistreated without becoming embroiled in the backstory of the mistreatment. I don't know how they do it. But, of course, this is what enables them to be successful. And a lot of these rescues, you'll go look at them. Like the good ones, the little bitty tiny rescues, you'll go look on Facebook or wherever, and they'll have, I mean, they'll have, like, really crummy pictures and videos. And you're going, can you please uh, put the focus on? They're not photographers, and they're not videographers. They don't have that skill set. They're, you know, fielding, uh, phone calls talking about uh, 12 puppies that need to uh, go somewhere. Or uh, two pregnant mama dogs. Yeah, it's all the time. And so they do, and so this is what happens. So they get the dogs who come into their rescue who can go north. We're not sending any county corsos north, you know. Not a lot of great Pyrenees going north. Because, I mean, are they going to take our big, aggressive dogs who've been unsocialized? Uh, no. No. They won't. So they're constantly having to pick and choose the dogs who will have the most success with our northern human beings. And when I first heard about this, these rescues, I'm going, because I'm an idiot, ignorant, idiot, southern person, What's so? Well, what's different about them? I mean, they're just up north. What's the big deal? And then I went on a transport, and we unloaded in. I don't know where it was, New York. And this rescue. I mean, this is this is. It was. It blew my mind. You can tell how backwards we are, and I am. When we got out of the when we got out of the van, loaded with all these dogs, we'd stopped in Tennessee and all other places to let them out, feed them. Just it's a gruel, and you're driving. You don't stop driving. You drive for thirty hours straight. So when we stopped at this place, what was it like a? It's usually like a, 
convenience center. They have those things. We don't have those down here very much. But there, you know, you can get gas and good food and all this. It's a, it's a, it's a big center, these places. I can't remember what they're called. And um, there were people there organized. You should have seen their faces. I'll never forget that as long as I live. These, and there were, yeah, and they all had their leashes, and they were all standing there in order with their leashes. God, makes me cry some more. Man. And so they're standing there being the human beings that at this point in our time, in our lives, and, and we're incapable of being. I mean, the looks on their faces, the anticipation, the the happiness, the hope, the joy. Oh, my gosh. To get these old dogs that we have thrown away, most of whom from high-kill shelters. All right. And so you get out of the van and you get they have you that the person tells you this these two people have this dog and so you get the dog and then when you turn to give that dog to those two people or that one person waiting the amount good grief the amount of care and respect and compassion and tenderness and gentleness that they stand there exuding for our dogs. It makes you ashamed. Made me ashamed of us. Ashamed of me too. It was an eye opener. All of us need to go on these transports to see those northern people. I mean, you've got to see it to believe it. And then you start asking yourself, why? Why do they have that? What? What is going on that these people have that gear, are able to see? Dogs and cats as living, feeling beings capable of everything, capable of sadness, of joy, of playtime, of concern, of worry, who feel cold, who feel hot, who feel pain, who feel sleepy and lazy and just a bunch of snuggle buddies. I don't know why. I don't know why we don't get it, and we don't. I'm telling you, we don't. And then they took these dogs, and I'm telling you, they treated, got the leash on the dogs, some of them big, some of them little. And listen, it was not any bunch of idiotic, oh, look how cute you are, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, no, this dog is an individual, and um, they know where the dogs are coming from. I mean, come on. I mean, gosh. And uh, they gently take those dogs, and there, there's always a place where you can go walk them immediately. And they walk the dog with consideration for the dog. Does the dog wish to go forward, to the right, or to the left? The dog is allowed to do so. The dog is not jerked hither and yon to go where the human has decided the dog needs to go. The feelings... The instincts, the intelligence of the dogs are appreciated, noticed, and nurtured. It's true. It's totally true. And you go on a transport, and you see, you look, you look back there, and you've got 70 beating hearts. I'm not kidding you. 70 animals back there looking. You open that transport door. You slide that thing back. And there they are. All of them looking at you. Trusting you. To do right 
by them. Because guess what a dog does? A dog always does right by us. Always. Name one time when your dog has failed you. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. And these rescues, you talk about a Herculean endeavor. And sometimes it's not good. I have uh, seen that. One time I, fo- I followed these uh, when I was in the throes of it. And I knew uh, I didn't realize I couldn't take it. Like some people can. But of course I couldn't let it go, right? Because I love dogs and cats. I'm looking at Zsa, Zsa right now. Just black and white tuxedo cat that was thrown away. She's absolutely gorgeous. Sumptuous. Sitting here on my desk. Uh, wonderful pet, lovely to look at. Right now, I mean, you know, I think I just relaxed uh, 10,000 degrees, if that's even possible. Yeah, that's what she did to me. Just looking at her right now. Coming up here to me, because she knows this. I am her safety zone. And you know what? That makes me feel good. So these rescues, I'm going to tell you what happens to them sometimes. Sometimes they start, I guess this is what would happen if I were to do a rescue, which I never would. I would never do that. There's no way. There's no way. It's too much. I can't handle it. So they start with one, and now watch these three rescues, what they did. I mean, they're helping, right? They're, I don't know where were they. I think one was in Pennsylvania. I think the other two were in the South. And so they all started with this wonderful, effusive, Joy, look at me, I'm starting to rescue, got my 5013C, and I'm pulling out these three rescues, but listen, this happens, this happens quite a bit, and rescue people, if you exhibit these behaviors, it's time for you to pull out, and you know, you need to pull out, just do it, all right, so they start the rescue, and, um, oh yeah, we're so happy, look, we got our 5013C, we're doing it. Coco's rescue everybody. Okay, look, please send me your blankets. You know, if you got any food, you want to donate them 5013C. Everything's tax deductible. What an exciting time to be alive. I'm so happy. I've been wanting to do this. I finally did it. Okay. Nine months later. You know what? I am not responsible for everybody's dogs. I have to have help transporting these dogs to the vet. Okay, this starts. Nine months. Nine months in. If that's happening, get out. Get out. Because here's what happens six months after that, if not less. And you can go and look. It's true. I hate people. I hate people. Rescuers, if you ever say that, you need to get out. Because I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen to you. Because I've seen it. I've watched it. You will die. You will die. Once hatred enters your heart, there follows despair. And you have written doom across your forehead. So here's what happens. That individual who has the rescue, who now hates human beings, and really starts griping about them all the time because, honestly, she's exhausted. Okay? Because what she thought was going to be five dogs in crates she could move lickety-split have now swelled to 25 dogs in crates and wherever else she can put them. And her husband's not very happy. But so what? She's rescuing dogs. She's doing something big and important. But she forgot about those vows she made to that good man. So here's what happens then health issues. You start seeing they have minor health issues and then it escalates. They start having bigger and bigger health issues. And so three years into it, the people who were not made to have rescues, well, they're they're ill. I mean, they start having heart attacks and uh, start having 
serious, serious illnesses where they can't get out of the bed and they can't walk. They cannot walk anymore. And of course, their backs have been pulled because they're lifting heavy dogs, rum it because they, because they got them. Oh gosh, it's just think about it. Think about the cleaning. Think about the cleaning you got to do for 25 dogs of all sizes. Or you got cats in there. 25, for 25, yeah. Even if you have, even if you, you're somewhat civilized and you've got the 25 dogs running around because you're, it's like, you're kind of like the dog whisperer and you can do the 25 dogs running around your yard. Well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> that's going to be a yard that's torn slap up. And that means your patio furniture. <laughs> that means, I mean, everything in there. And probably the skirting on your house. Oh, yeah. You know, the side, you got wood. There's probably going to be some chewing on the side of your house. Yeah. All right, so then that's what happens. So then the major illnesses come, and then um, a year later, you're dead. You're literally dead. You're they're having um, that's five years into rescue, and you're dead. You don't believe me? Look, it's true. I watched it happen. These three women did it. They're dead. They're dead. That was that was the trajectory. Nine months in, first month, I'm so happy, I can't believe it. Nine months in, uh, I gotta have some help, nobody wants to help me. Three months later, I hate humans, boom, it's over. Then the illnesses start. And the person's brain, they can't see straight anymore. I've also known rescues, their husbands left them because of the rescue. You think, we're just taking animals to high-kill shelters. And we're euthanizing them, but we're, we're euthanizing humans, too. You know what the definition of euthanasia is? They need to find another word, because here is the definition of euthanasia. The act or process of putting to death for humane purposes used to refer to the killing of animals in order to relieve or avoid pain. Well... We need to find another word because what's the word for we're killing healthy dogs because we got a pet overpopulation problem here and the only and everybody's on board with killing healthy dogs. And you're going, I beg your pardon, madam. I am most certainly not on board with killing healthy mama dogs who are pregnant with 10 puppies. How dare you? Well, sir, ma'am, do you think that the High Kill Shelters are doing a GoFundMe account each month to pay for the chemicals to proceed? Or do you think your tax-paying dollars are paying for that act, those acts? We're paying for it. Mr. Homeless Person, you shrug and say, I'm not paying for it. I'm homeless. I don't pay for anything. That person who gave you $50 and then you bought some socks and a Coca-Cola and some chips and a sandwich, you just paid taxes. You're in on it too. We're all in on it. I could be mistaken if there is a high kill shelter that is doing a GoFundMe account each month. Please let me know. Otherwise, there is our reality. We're all in cahoots with this with this mess. Yeah. None of us, none of us can say I want no part of it. You want no, that's fine. You don't want any part of it, but you are actively taking part of it if you ever buy anything anywhere. And that's a fact. We're all doing it. But, yes, that's awful. I agree. We are figuring it out. We are doing it. We are growing by leaps and bounds and more and more coming to the realization and the knowledge and the certainty that dogs, cats, horses, all 
are living, breathing, thinking, problem-solving beings. They have likes and dislikes. Zsa Zsa, she has a certain chair she likes to sleep in. That's my black and white cat. The pit bull, of course, will sleep anywhere. And she likes a lot of sleep. Prone to laziness. Told you all about her. She likes to be around me. And so she is around me. The car, she likes to run around outside and make citizens arrest. That is what she does. I know she likes that. I know that gives her delight. That is the life I give her. The life she wants. Don't you want someone to give you the life that you want that is suited to your personality, to your physical build, to your mind? Don't you want someone to look at you and try to bring happiness into your life? To try to bring happiness and peace? I know that I do. So I do it for my dogs. And every day, I mean, you can see the background that we come from here, and it's all of us, okay? I have never met a Southern person who is a forward thinker regarding animal welfare, ever, okay? No. Maybe they were from the North and they came here, and I mean, God, boy, they were, whew, I don't even know what, I don't even know what a Northern person thinks when they come here and see, there was this guy. There was this guy from Pennsylvania. And um, he was very skilled in his job, and they have this. There was this plant open in, in um, Bastrop, Louisiana, and he, you know, he went up for the job. It was great paying, and he had the skills, and he got the job. And so he came down here. Of course, you know, you get a new job, it pays great, and he used his skills, and it's open in the plant. It was an exciting time for him, and um, so he comes down here to check out Bastrop. So in order to move his family, his wife and two teenagers, teenage son and teenage daughter. I mean, he got the job, right? Got the job, got the house, probably got a fantastic house because they got some fine houses in Bastrop. And I'm sure, you know, the red carpet was rolled out. Well, he came down here, spent some time, and uh, told his family, uh, y'all aren't moving down here. And that's a true story. And so he didn't. He did not move his family down here. Why? Why not? Was it because of the animals? I don't know. Why would that guy do that? What did he see down here that made him not want to bring his family here? This is a true story. I don't know. I wonder what he saw. Because I don't see it, right? I mean, I love everybody here. Like, oh, so you get to the dog stuff, animal stuff. Yeah, I back up and go. Uh, I don't like that very much. But what did that man see that he was going, no, uh, y'all are staying where you are. But we are moving forward. People are reporting animal abuse more and more often. We have fantastic laws here. We've got great laws. Which I'm going to go over in one of my short stories in March. But this story transported, it's t it t I mean, how many times has a dog, how many instances, how many instances do there need to be of a dog or an animal literally changing your life, the trajectory of your life, and helping you to see the world in a new, different, and wonderful way? dogs I mean they're such they're such innocent pure beings and they stay like that their entire lives they never lose their innocence they never lose their purity they and they love us boy they love us isn't that isn't that wonderful to like right now who's here with me uh, do, of course the pits here because the, oh no that's it the pit and the um, black and white cat. Who else? Oh, and Kissy. So two cats are inside. And the pit, because the pit, I mean, I am her, I'm her mama. Boy, she's my little noni bear. I'll tell you what. I've told you all about her. She's just too cool for school. Throwaway dog. Boy, they missed out on her. I mean, she's a jewel. She's a jewel. We have amazing dogs here. Amazing. Gorgeous. Fine dogs. Healthy dogs. If you want to get a dog, oh, let me tell you that real quick. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard at Washita Parish Animal Shelter, a dog will be, uh, the first thing they do is they scan for, when a dog is, if it's not an owner surrender, they probably do it all the time anyhow, they scan for the microchip. And so they will find the microchip and it will have the breeder's information. You know how your breeder says, we'll always take our dogs back. Well, these breeders never return the shelter's phone calls. Even when the shelter describes the dog and reads the breeder's contact information to them, the breeder does not call back. And they let the breeder know they're calling from a high-kill shelter. You have, a, you have a rescue for everything. You have a rescue for toy dogs. Nina's Road to Rescue. She got them constantly coming in. It's nonstop. A little bit. What does she have now? She's got, she has Shih Tzu puppies. Somebody, you know, who, yeah. So you want to get some full-bred, full-blooded Shih Tzu puppies? Right. And you know that no dog is full-blooded, right? Every dog comes from a mixture of dogs. Right? So all dogs, if you've got other oh, purebred, well, no, they're actually mutts. They come from two different dogs, three different dogs. You'll find out. Look at the breeding history of the dog, of the Wamariner, of the Poodle, of the Pit Bull, of the Labrador Retriever, of the Irish Setter, of the Chihuahua. They're all, I mean, if you're saying a mixed breed, they're all, all dogs or mixed breeds, every single one of them every single one of them so if you want a three-legged dog there's a three-legged rescue if you want a white dog there's a white if you want a blind white dog there's a blind white dog rescue if you want a black dog with white spots there's going to be a rescue with blind with a black dog with white spots you name it there's a rescue for it and most of them they are trying they're trying every idea that they can think of to help the dogs, to move the dogs, to find, the, get the dog into good homes. And uh, we won't spay and neuter. And there's this place, Robinson's Rescue. In, I mean, you wouldn't believe all the cheap spay and neuter around here. I mean, you can get your dog. You can get your dog. I mean, this is this is how much it has changed. Five years ago, when uh, when I got the car fixed, it was three hundred dollars. Now it would cost me fifty dollars. That's how much it's changed. Everybody's on board. We realize there's a pet overpopulation. All the vets are on board now. I mean, all of my dogs are capable of having up to six. Uh, I've seen black mouth curs have twenty puppies, no sweat. Just boom, right there. And a pit bull, we all know pit bulls can have puppies. 16 in a litter. My Bill Black Dog, 16, 17. 16, I, there's no way that I could ever let my dogs have puppies. These dogs who bring so much to my life, so much joy, so much love, so much care and kindness and protection, I could not even go to sleep at night. Not at, at, at 16... Of my black dog, I couldn't. I mean, I have to know. And then where were? And then they're breeding. There's no way. No, they're getting fixed. No, none of my dogs are having puppies. No way. I could not mentally do that. Not the way that I see people. How people treat dogs. I just, I just wouldn't. Uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But the good news is, and I'm saying it again, we're figuring it out. We really and truly are. We're figuring it out. And there is no need for hatred or despair. And once you go negative, you're no longer any use to anyone, at least of all to the dog. So if that starts happening to you, you need to back out as fast as you can. And don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel ashamed. You tried it. You're not emotionally equipped to do an animal rescue. There is nothing wrong with that. There are a lot of people who are very equipped and who are going to do a wonderful, wonderful job at it and accomplish more than you could have ever even dreamed about because 
despair and hatred somehow is not even in their makeup. So when that starts happening, you need to back out of it as fast as you can. And believe me, people will step up to help you. And they will not judge you. Those rescue people, you talk about extraordinary human beings, even the ones who go dark. You've never met such loving, kind, genuinely compassionate people, both for humans and dogs. I mean, they're, they're extraordinary individuals, really true heroes. I don't know how they do it. But they do do it. They do do it. And they laugh and they play. And they love their husbands. They love their children. And they have good lives. I've seen it. They have, they have somehow found the balance. Figured out how to keep everything balanced. And they are to be admired and supported. How do you support? If you can't, uh, well, here are the ways to support. If you can't foster a dog, because that's a lot, fostering a dog. So that's one option. What does fostering mean? Fostering is when you um, you take the dog into your home. You, you go with the rescue. Here, let me tell you this much right now. You go with a rescue that already has placed the dog. And the legitimate rescues, the ones who are, the ones who have kept their heads about them, they are not, they're going to know where the dog is going. If you have a dog in your home for six months to a year who is a foster dog, I wouldn't deal with that rescue anymore, okay, because they've lost their way. But the legitimate rescues, you're only going to have the dog for a couple of weeks, a month maybe, if they're going through heartworm treatment. But the, so they got to do the heartworm treatment. And then the dog goes north, so you can foster if you like. Or if you don't have room, time, or the heart for it, I get it. I totally get it. You can bring blankets. They always need sheets and blankets and towels because, you know, there's a lot of waste with dogs, with 20 dogs. Shelters always need towels, cleaning supplies, you know, always, constantly, nonstop. They always need dog food, good dog food. Get, get some good dog food. What else? Collars and leashes, they always need that kind of stuff. Like those old rags you were going to throw away, take them to the shelter. They need them. They'll go through them. What else do they need? Pee pads. Puppy rooms, when they have puppies, they need pee pads. They go through pee pads like you would not believe. They always, shelters always need pee pads constantly. So you can do pee pads. Go and look at their Amazon wish list. They have Amazon wish list, and you can see what they need. They're there. And the transporting, that is a lot of fun. Now, you can do it like that with the 70 dogs or whatever, the bigger transports, but you can also do it just carrying one dog like Fred and Naomi are doing. They have them, and I think they are, in fact, called, I think this one is called the Overground Railway or something. And I did that. I've done that before. I've carried a, uh, a blind boxer. I did one leg from here to Shreveport. I took a bull mastiff mix puppy to Vicksburg, Mississippi. So you can do that. You can just do a leg. It's a two-hour drive. You drive the dog there, and it's like that. There's no chit-chatting because they're on this tight schedule because some of the, some of the transports are 20 legs. So you got 20 stops, and then sometimes you go overnight. You do whatever you want. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, and, boy, it is, it is truly a spiritual endeavor. You are helping that living, thinking, breathing problem-solving being on his or her way to a loving environment. I mean, what, what beats that? Nothing. This has been Dog Food with Catherine Abel. I thank y'all so much for listening to me as I meander around in these stories. I love telling them. I'm completely into it. I think you can tell. I love having you here. All right, you guys. Until next time.